Next up, we have Dr. Heath Jolliffe with, with us again. If you are just joining in this afternoon, he gave a great lecture on the excited delirium patient this morning that I recommend you all go back and listen to. I'm gonna save the long introduction since most of us are aware of him, but Dr. Jolliffe is a medical toxicologist and he's here to talk to us now about up and coming street drugs that we should care about. So Dr. Jolliffe, the floor is yours. Thanks Dr. Bowers, appreciate it. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. So I wanna to talk to you about drugs of abuse and it's something that we all see in the emergency department and these things just keep changing. Even as a toxicologist, sometimes it's very difficult to keep up on all these things. And so it's always an interesting thing that, to do an update on. Um, I don't have anything to disclose. Um, objectives are gonna be in your hand out there. Let's get right into some cases. So these are all real cases. This is a 28 year old male comes in by EMS for a drug overdose. Um, he has meiosis. He has a GCS of four, respiratory rate is low, has track marks. ED administers naloxone because they're like, this is obviously an opiate overdose. He wakes up and in the ED, he's like super confused. Like, I don't know why I'm here. And we said, you know, you're doing uh, heroin or something. He goes, I, I never touch heroin or anything. He said, I'm, I shoot up Coke all the time. His urine drug screen is positive for cocaine, negative for opiates. So the question is, what does that mean? So we'll go on to our next case. 18 year old gentleman comes in by EMS for drug overdose. He and his friend are found unconscious in a car. Uh, they bring both of them in. On arrival at the, when EMS gets there, his GCS is about eight. His heart rate is low in the fifties. His blood pressure is low, 79 or 46. He has meiosis, so small pupils. They give him eight milligrams of naloxone, so a pretty good dose, no change at all. Comes to the emergency department. His urine drug screen is negative. Gets admitted to the ICU and 12 hours later is awake and talking and everything. And medics noted that they found these pills that you see here uh, in his possession at the time. So the question is, hmm, what could this be? Next case is uh, even more puzzling. This is a young lady who is at a party smoking pot with friends. Um, and suddenly she is completely out of it, not awake. Uh, friends think maybe she took something else. Everyone else was just smoking pot. Her GCS is four. Her respiratory rate is low. Her BP is low. Her SATs are low. They give naloxone, no changes to her at all. She comes into the emergency department, gets intubated. Her urine drug screen is negative. And the question is, what the heck does this mean? And lastly, we have a 18 year old male who has a first time seizure after snorting drugs at a party. This is a, a pill party where, you know, people get their pills and prescriptions together and a bunch of kids are doing different things and they're smashing up pills and snorting them. He's post dicta when he arrives. Blood pressure is 110 over 70. Heart rate's in the 140s. Uh, his uh, saturation's 98%. He does have a history of depression, no history of seizures, no family history of seizures. His finger stick blood sugar is 110. His urine drug screen is negative. And two hours later, completely asymptomatic and ready to go home. And the question is, what's this all about? So we see a lot of these cases in the emergency department. And usually we see opiates and opioids still the number one thing. Well, alcohol is still the number one thing, but that's another talk. So opiates and opioids are there sedatives, benzodiazepines, usually the Z drugs, we'll talk about those. Stimulants are still big, cocaine, methamphetamine, those type of things. Marijuana is everywhere now because of uh, many states have some form of legal marijuana, whether it be recreational or medicinal. And then the big category of synthetics, which we'll talk a lot about, which makes uh, our jobs all tougher. So getting back to the easier thing, or at least what we thought was easy, opiates and opioids. So Prescription opiates and opioids are still one of the major thing that we're still seeing despite all the legal changes in that. But then there's heroin and fentanyl. And when an addict tells me they're using heroin, in my mind, that's probably maybe heroin mixed with fentanyl, maybe completely fentanyl, maybe one of the analogs like car fentanyl and the many other analogs that are out there, but almost all heroin is contaminated with fentanyl. And I will tell you that most street drugs are contaminated with fentanyl, cocaine, and, and several other things. 
Um, so people frequently ask, you know, do I need to use a bigger dose of naloxone when I'm having things like carfentanil and things like that? And the short answer is probably not. You know, I don't want these people to be completely awake and causing issues in the ER. I just want to bring them up enough that I don't have to intubate them and things like that. So I'm still using pretty small doses of uh, my naloxone initially. I'm still using 0.4 milligrams and doubling and that. Um, because I just want to bring them up so they're breathing and I don't have to intubate them. Obviously, if you have somebody that's blue in front of you and really going down the tubes and use bigger doses, that's fine. EMS protocols are very different throughout the country. Um, but the big thing of it is, is you also have to think about what are the other diseases these people may have. You know, when I was a resident, you would see a case of an epidural abscess from a heroin injection once or twice in your residency program. And now we see it all the time in the situations that I'm involved in, and your folks are seeing that too. You're seeing endocarditis in young people um, and all the other diseases, HIV, hepatitis C, and those type of things. So think about that too. And then the other question is, how long do we need, really need to watch these people? And there's two fairly good studies on that that basically says that after your last dose of naloxone, if they are alert and oriented, if their GCS is 15, I like to say add on if they can eat and drink and they're able to get up and walk about two hours after that last dose of naloxone, they're probably okay to come home or to go home. Now, if they're still a little sleepy, if you've had to give them another dose of naloxone, then that clock starts over again. So I like to use about two hours. Um, most of these folks don't need admitted, but if I have to give multiple doses of uh, naloxone, if they keep falling asleep, then they need to either come into an, an OBS bed or be watched longer in the ER. I attended a, a conference yesterday uh, from some forensic toxicologists, um, and they actually were talking a little bit about what we're seeing across the US. So this data all comes from a friend of mine by the name of Barry Logan. Barry runs the largest reference lab in the country. Um, and this is kind of interesting. If we look at deaths, um, this is people back in the early 80s, and we see people that were dying of amphetamines, and then heroin came on the scene, and then late 80s and 90s, it was cocaine and crack, and then methamphetamine, and then the pain pill problem that we have, and then fentanyl, and then fentanyl analogs. But if you look at this graph, this thing is actual exponential. And so the number of fentanyl deaths has far outpaced everything else we're seeing in the fentanyl analog. So think about that. And the other thing I was talking about with all these synthetics, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, he had a great slide that he allowed me to share, um, is what we call novel synthetic opioids. And we, we've equipped all these things into novel psychoactive substances. So, and you will look at these names and most of these things you'll never recognize. These are all synthetic opioids that are out there. And you can see in 2021, the big thing. The big thing that I was really interested in 2019 is this isotonatazine. And this was big in the Midwest. Started in Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio, which is really interesting. Not on the coast. This thing is still out there. But like most things is once we pick these things up, these things get classified as a schedule one drug, they become illegal. Nine to 12 months later, something else comes on the market to replace it because when laws are written, they have to list these specific drugs. You can't say all the Me Too drugs like it. So what happens is nine to 12 months after this drug was on there, it disappeared. And then we started seeing this one over here. And then nine to 12 months later, they simply just changed the chemical structure just slightly. And these are all basically the same drug with just a different chemical thing. And so these are all the things that we're now finding in as far as synthetic opioids that are out there. And sadly, none of these will be picked up by your typical urine drug screen that you have in your emergency department. Sedatives. Uh, benzodiazepines are still really big. You know, I have a lot of patients who like Xanax and, and things like that. And with sedatives, usually it means sedation with stable vital signs as their typical toxidrome. Then there's the Z drugs like Zolpidem and the things that people use for sleep. Some of the ER docs that I know use them to help sleep better. Those started getting abused a little bit because they were thought to be a little safer. Um, and most of these things are supportive care. Um, so not such a big deal. But then synthetics came on the market. And this is one that, um, that's a picture of me holding a bottle of this drug called Penzor. Um, and when Penzor came on the, the when this case happened, um, this was back in 2015. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how this case progressed, but this was a drug that none of us had heard of. And now there are multiple iterations of this drug that is a synthetic, completely designer made benzodiazepine. They have no therapeutic uh, reason for this. They're not a prescription or anything like that. And now we're seeing deaths with benzodiazepines. It's very difficult to go back in the literature and never find a death due solely to benzodiazepines. 
Valium and alcohol, Ativan and opioids, yes, but just a benzodiazepine itself. But we're actually seeing deaths with this. And again, supportive care, they're probably going to stay uh, sedated longer. The deaths are probably due to prolonged sedation, CNS depression, airway issues. And the big thing is avoid flumazenil. You know, flumazenil came out when I was a resident. We thought this is great. We're going to have a Narcan for benzodiazepines. But the problem of it is, is flunazomenol takes the benzodiazepine off the receptor, it binds onto here. And then if these people are using on a chronic basis, the biggest thing you worry about is they're going to seize. And then what do you do? You've blocked the receptor for 20 to 30 minutes and benzodiazepines aren't going to help you. I just don't see a real reason for this. And I can tell you countless cases that I've seen uh, and actually testified in with people who have used this drug resulting in really bad effects, including death. So I tell people stay away from flumazenil, just do supportive care on your benzodiazepines and they should get better. Stimulants. Stimulants are still a huge thing out there. Some pathomimetic toxidrome um, looks a lot like anticholinergic also. Anticholinergic is usually a little bit more dry than the people with a true sympathomimetic. Cocaine is still the big thing. We talked about that earlier when we were talking about the excited delirium lecture. Amphetamines, lots of different amphetamines out there, including methamphetamine and all these synthetics. Synthetic cathinones, for those of you who have been around long enough to remember bath salts with methadrone, those drugs are still there. It's just methadrone we don't see anymore. It's just all these new analogs that we see. And synthetic cannabinoids are not THC. This is a combination, almost like a sympathomimetic anticholinergic type drug, novel psychoactive drug. It's sprayed onto plant material like herbs and things like that. Looks like marijuana. People can roll it up and smoke it, but don't have any effects like marijuana. Big things, stimulants, cocaine, avoid beta blockers for the unopposed alpha stimulation. And this is one place that if I knew in advance, um, I might avoid my antipsychotics. You know, if you look at the papers associated with the hyperactive delirium, severe agitation, excited delirium, those type of things, antipsychotics have been fairly safe. But when the uh, problem was out with bath salts, several cases in the tox literature of people being very hyperstimulated, getting a antipsychotic, a lot of times um, Haldol, and then dying within minutes after it was given. So I would try to avoid this, but a lot of times we don't have the luxury of knowing what it is. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a big ketamine fan for these things. So I definitely avoid your beta blockers. You might avoid antipsychotics in these folks. I like my benzos. I like my ketamine for this, these folks also. So, and let's talk about cannabinoids. Let's talk about the real cannabinoids, the natural things, marijuana. So everyone talks about THC, the impairing ingredient, CBD, possibly some therapeutic effects, but there are tons and tons of cannabinoids out there. CBN is a big one, CBD, CBC, all these other things that are out there that may, uh, we might see later on to help with various different medical conditions. The big thing is impairment issues. And it's a huge area of study because most states have some type of laws allowing marijuana now. So the question is, what does that mean for the workplace? What does that mean for driving? How long do you tell a patient after they use marijuana before they're allowed to drive or work? Um, and, and, you know, those are huge issues and we don't have all the answer. Um, I have a friend of mine who is a professional athlete and was not getting better from an injury and a doc recommended CBD to her. And she asked me what I thought about it. And I said, well, the problem of it is, is the CBD you buy over the counter hardly has any CBD in it at all. Lots of studies have analyzed these products. It's just a waste of your money. The percentages are so low, they probably don't do anything at all. The other problem is a lot of CBD is contaminated with THC. So I told her, if you get a drug test done and you have a contamination of THC and you trigger a positive marijuana on your drug test as a professional athlete, what would that mean to you? And she said, I, I would be out. And I said, it's probably not worth doing it then because of those two things. The other things that you see is this impairment issue. In Ohio, we have a per se level. I'd mentioned that before, meaning that if you have marijuana metabolite in your urine after you're driving, it means you're impaired. But that's not what it means. The metabolite isn't impairing. It's not active or anything like that. It'd be really great if we could test your blood, but it's, THC is only in blood for about two hours. So we use urine for longer duration. But as I mentioned in my lecture before, you can have a week, 30 days, 60 days, maybe up to 70 days where urine can still be positive in people that use chronic THC. And that doesn't have anything to do with uh, impairment at all. 
Um, saliva and breath is a new area of study, but it's still really difficult. Um, so we just don't have the answers to this. So a lot of states are using per se levels. Unfortunately, there's not actually been a level established when somebody is impaired with marijuana. And so it makes things very difficult. We're all pretty aware of the GI symptoms, this whole cyclic vomiting type thing, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, supportive care, how it all has been shown to work, topical capsaicin, uh, hot showers, and those type of things. Psych issues are very controversial because you'll see marijuana being touted for anxiety and lots of things, PTSD, but also these have also been shown to make these conditions worse. So it's a real big balancing act there also. Um, remember, there's no drug that's 100% safe. So even with things like marijuana, I'm like, yeah, there might be some really good uses for that, but no one wants to talk about the risks and the problems, especially the people that are making money off of it. It's the THC concentration. In the 70s, there was about 1% to 3% THC in marijuana. Uh, the recent study has shown that uh, up to 2017, that's gone up 27%. So now the average THC concentration in marijuana is about 30%. In Colorado, where I trained at, you can get THC concentrations above 90% uh, right now. So that's a big difference. That's like saying heroin and fentanyl are the same drug when they're much more concentrated. And that's why we see more deaths with fentanyl than we do with heroin. And then the big thing is peds lots of issues. Kids getting into marijuana do not have good outcomes a lot of times. You know, we published a paper a couple of years ago, me and uh, Dr. Andy Lubitz, on what happens to kids that get into marijuana and, and come to emergency departments. And the interesting things is kids have CNS depression, respiratory depression, kids have seizures, kids have been on ventilators. So if people are using these things, they really need to keep it locked up and away from children. But the big thing is supportive care with the cannabinoids. So let's talk about the synthetics and the MPS, like I said. So these are novel psychoactive substances. That's kind of where we've thrown this uh, term in. So why are these things here? Well, people are trying to get a better high. Um, so the drug chemists are saying, well, maybe if we manipulate the molecule like this, we can get a better high. Maybe we can get rid of some of the side effects. The biggest reason they're doing it is to avoid legal issues. So again, the law says you have to ban this chemical. You can't say all the precursors and post things and all these things. So they will simply say, well, you know what, let's just halogenate this compound. And now it has a whole different name and, it, and we can skirt the law. We're seeing this with fentanyl and all its analogs that you see and all those drugs I showed you before, the designer benzodiazepines, the cathinones are still there and all these different cannabinoids that you see also. If there's money to be made, it will be made. And how can you help as ER physicians? And I think this is super important. We get our information from emergency departments. We get it from people who say, you know what? Something doesn't sound right here. I'm gonna ask somebody. So if you think that you might have a drug that you're not seeing before, or you talk to the police, I, I talk to my patients, I talk to my drug dealers that come in the ER and everything and be like, what's new out there? What are you staying away from? What should I be aware of? Um, talk to your toxicologist if you have one. If you don't, talk to your poison center. Um, and if you're thinking this is a new drug and I want somebody to figure this out, urine is your best specimen. Blood is not. Most things do not stay in blood for very long. They stay in urine. Blood is harder to hang on to. Urine, you put it in urine cup, you seal it, you put it on dry ice. 30 days later, we can still analyze it. It's harder to do with blood. Um, and then it needs to get sent to a reference lab. And your toxicologist, your poison center can help you with that. And the biggest thing is getting it reported so that forensic toxicologists, labs, toxicologists do medical work like I do, people in drug abuse, we can find this stuff out. And a really good example is the case that I, I showed you earlier with the people with the unknown yellow pills. And I'm going to um, show you that here real quick. So that drug was called Penzor, and they actually had the bottle. And um, as you can see at the very top of the slide is the actual name of this chemical, super long and everything like that. So this drug is actually clonazolam, not clonazepam. And it's really funny because it says warning, not for human consumption. But if you just walk up on the label a little bit, it says if consumption occurs, immediately call your local emergency number, do not operate machine or motor vehicles, consumption can result in death and everything. So that's a drug I definitely would not wanna take. Um, but what was interesting is when the very astute ER physician called me on this case and she said clonazolam, I thought she meant clonazepam. You know, we know what that is. And so I went into poison decks right away when she corrected me, our database, not there. So then I went to Dr. Google and all the websites that clonazolam came up on were in Russian. And so that tells you something right now. And these guys had ordered this off the internet. And so right away I said, okay, we've got a new drug here that I've not heard of before. We have two patients that have some pretty severe things going on with them. We need to report this. 
So I called my friend who runs one of the largest reference labs and said, hey, could you guys analyze the pills? And if I send you a urine specimen, said, absolutely, we'll, we'll figure it out. And so we did. And so the great thing about this is Dr. Rachel Price and I reported this, and she presented this at the uh, North American Congress of Clinical Toxicology, which is our big uh, toxicology conference in 2016. It then got published in uh, Toxicology Journal, Clinical Toxicology, and we got a lot of attention of other toxicologists and reference lab people because this was the first case reported in the United States, and it happened in Columbus, Ohio, of all places, which is really interesting. And then once you do this, then it just becomes this chain effect. I got contacted from two forensic toxicologists in Europe, and they said, we're writing a textbook on forensic labs. We want to know if you'll write the chapter on synthetic benzodiazepines. And I'm like, okay, we'll do that. And then my friend said, we need to get this published in the forensic toxicology literature. So we did that. And now it's funny, I get calls from attorneys and legal folks and law enforcement from around the country saying, hey, you're kind of the go-to expert on these synthetic benzodiazepines. So the one thing I tell you, if you publish something like this, you're going to become the go-to expert on it also. But this is really helpful so that other people can be aware of this. And now this clonazolam that we found, there are at least 40 other synthetic benzodiazepines out there that are very similar like this. So let's go back to those cases real quickly because we're starting to run out of time here. So that first case, a guy thinks he's shooting up cocaine and he really did think that. Uh, his opiates were negative, his cocaine was positive, but it all sounded like that this was a classic opioid toxidrome. Well, it was, and that's because his cocaine was contaminated with fentanyl. So the fentanyl was the thing that made him go unconscious, responded to with the naloxone that he had. There was some cocaine there, so your drug is positive for cocaine, negative for opiates because fentanyl is an opioid and doesn't show up well on here, and we just can't detect it. And that's back before we knew that so much drugs were being contaminated uh, by these products. Case two is the one that we just talked about. This was a synthetic benzodiazepine called clonazolam. Um, UDS is often negative, but there are some UDSs about a third of the time will not detect this, but about two thirds of the time they will. Um, but it doesn't tell you what it is. And the big thing with this is that what was really interesting about this case is this guy had a low GCS. They each took one tablet, which was interesting. He had bradycardia and hypotension. His buddy, who was also had altered GCS, was almost comatose, was hypertensive and tachycardic. So that was a little bit odd. And within 12 hours, they were both perfectly okay. What's even more interesting was within a week to two weeks of this incident in the ER, they presented again with the same exact thing. So they hadn't learned that they shouldn't take this medication, um, despite its label of telling you it might kill you. Case three, um, this is the girl who's smoking pot, gets really sick, has respiratory failure, and ends up intubated. What in the world is that? Synthetic cannabinoids. There's some recent papers out there that's showing about 20% of people using cannabinoids will have respiratory failure. Not really certain why, to be honest with you on these things. They're not detected by UDS. This is not THC. Um, this is all you know, synthetic marijuana, even though it's not marijuana. This is more of a sympathomimetic anticholinergic type drug. Uh, and so it's very challenging to figure out why this is happening. Uh, and she ended up doing well, but was on the ventilator for a couple of days. Um, and so that's something that you just don't expect at all. In the last case, um, this is a kid with depression who is crushing up pills with friends and snorting them, and he has a seizure, first-time seizure, and then he becomes asymptomatic. Well, his prescription uh, medication was uh, bupropion, um, which is known to cause seizures and overdose or just taking too much. And about 20% of people who snort it will have a seizure. Usually the seizures resolve before they even get to the ER. Sometimes you'll have a second one, usually not. Um, usually within the first four to six hours, that's it. So if they're asymptomatic, they can usually go home. They're not at risk for continued seizures or anything like that. Uh, the problem of it is this drug isn't going to show up on a drug screen either. This was all his parents bringing in his pills and everything. And as soon as we figured out what it was, um, and you know, you can get a level of anything, we can get a bupropion level or anything like this, but this is, this is fairly common. And unfortunately, kids have been abusing this drug a lot. So in summary, drugs of abuse are going to continue to change. People are making money off of it. They're trying to skirt the laws. Most of them are supportive care. Just do what you do every day. Good critical care, good ER skills are going to get these patients through it and get you well. Make sure you document well. Ask for help. Ask your patients what they're doing out there. Ask the police. Ask your tox people for help. Um, and if you have something that's new and doesn't make sense, you know, call your poison center. Um, I've had people from all over the country call me and say, hey, I've got this thing that's new. Um, how, how can we report this? I'm happy to help you with that. Um, your poison center number is there. 
um, to call. And, uh, you know, the big thing is just asking for help on these cases because they can be very challenging. And that's all I have. So if anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. And my email address is up there. I'm always happy to help folks out if they have any questions or if I can help you in any way. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jolliffe. We do have one comment in the chat. Thanks, Dr. Bowers. Um, someone said they've been seeing a lot of teens smoking wax pens that have come in with severe CNS symptoms. I don't know if that's something you're familiar with. So I would love to know more about the case because wax pens have been synthetic cannabinoids, but there's been some reports of other drugs. So I'd love to know if they know what it is. Um, and that's, that's a great point though, is when patients say something like I'm using wax pens, the first thing I say is, tell me what that is. Um, you know, don't, don't worry about being ignorant. <laughs> you know, I just say, what is that? Or what do you think that is? Because those terms often depending on where you are in the country can be a completely different thing. So I'd be really curious to see what that is. And if the uh, person that made the comment wants to reach out to me, please do. I'd love to chat with you more about that. It's a very good point that a lot of our patients can actually give us a lot of information that can help in the future if we just ask them about it. Well, we're running yep. low on time. Absolutely. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up here. If anyone has any more questions for Heath, you're welcome to reach out to him. And once again, thank you for another great toxicology lecture.